And good evening, one and all. Welcome back to the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, coming to you from a broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And to find out about the programming we have available for you 24 7, 365, as well as the new programming, visit www.xzbn.net. And for all the programming on the Exxon TV channel, channel 21 on Simul TV, www.simultv.com. My guest this hour is Ken Jeremiah. He has appeared several times on History's channel's Ancient Aliens. He has written more than 10 books about various subjects, including critical thinking, history, and unusual phenomena. He currently resides in Rhode Island, and uh, his website is kenjeremiah.com. And Ken, welcome to the Exxon. Great having you with us. Hi, Rob. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ken, tell us how you got involved in the world of the strange, weird, bizarre. <laughs> yeah, if you if you had told me years ago that mm-hmm. I'd be researching mummification and uh, different societies' beliefs and what happens after death, I, I had no idea that I'd be doing anything like that. It was a, a strange phenomenon in northern Japan that drew me into this. Um, for years, I was uh, running tour groups through Kyoto, Hiroshima, and mm-hmm. Tokyo. And one year, I decided to explore the northernmost islands. And the original plan was for me to actually go into Siberia through Hokkaido, um, the northernmost island there. Right. And on a on a train ride from Sapporo to Asahikawa, I started talking to an old gen- older gentleman who asked me what I was doing in Japan, and I explained it to him. And he said, have you seen the Soko Shimbutsu? And we're speaking in Japanese. I really thought I was misunderstanding what he was saying. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what the word meant. I looked it up, and of course, there's nothing in the dictionary. So I asked him to explain it, and he, he's explaining to me, and I still think I'm misunderstanding this, that there are a bunch of individuals who had mummified themselves while still alive. And that didn't make any sense to no. me. I truly thought I knew a ton about Japanese history. So I literally abandoned my plans, went right back to Yamagata, and visited the first of many bodies. And that led to this huge investigation where I visited tons of bodies of individuals who mummified themselves. I translated books, and I actually I have the only English-language book on the subject of self-mummification called Living Buddhas, the Self-Mummified Monks of Yamagata, Japan. Wow. When I, when I hear the word mummification, I automatically think of Egypt and the mummies in Egypt, but I wasn't aware of that. There was mummification that was done in other parts of the world as well. Oh, yeah, it's actually everywhere, and even modern Christian burials. If really? you ever go to a wake and you mm-hmm. see the person, the person looks normal, they, they're they not smelling bad, they're not uh, puffed up, they're not a strange color. Right. Those people have been mummified. So can we say so mummification is like embalming, is yeah. So embalming is mummification? Yes, it is. I gotcha, all right. Yeah, the original, yeah, the original term for embalming is to put bombs on someone to make them smell good, but any kind of mummification mm-hmm. typically we refer to as embalming. And there are ways to mummify without without embalming as well, but modern mummification techniques, typically that's what they do. Now, the, the self-mummification mm-hmm. thing is truly bizarre, though. All right, now when we talk about mummification with the Egyptians, we, uh, as far as I understand it, they, they used to take out all the vital organs, the brain and everything else, put mm-hmm. them in jars so that on the other side of the afterlife, they, you know... W- you know, that would be part of their resurrection. I don't, I don't know if that's the right word. But when we're talking about yeah. modern-day mummification, are we also talking about the removal of the special organs and the brain and so on? In some societies, yes, but typically, no, that's not really necessary to be done. Mm-hmm. And even, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, a lot of the Christian mummification techniques. So most of the saints, the um, Orthodox and Catholic saints, were all intentionally mummified. Mm-hmm. And... Depending on the solution used, if you used an arsenic-based solution, you actually didn't need to remove any of the internal organs. So the way you can tell if it's an arsenic-based solution, if you see a body that's mm-hmm. extremely old but yet still has like rosy red skin right. and kind of looks alive, it's pretty much evidence that that's an arsenic-based solution. Well, why would Christians mummify? Well, that's an interesting thing. A lot of I wrote an entire book mm-hmm. called Christian Mummification, um, and throughout the whole text, I kind of showed the connections between the Christian faith, uh, I shouldn't say Christian faith, I should be more specific, the Catholic Christian faith and Egyptian religion. And originally in Egypt, they had about nine different aspects to the soul. 
And then as time go on, uh, time moved on, that number mm-hmm. kind of diminished. And then you see in early Christianity, you see there are three distinct elements of the soul that are within Christianity, and then that started to fade, but you still have remnants of it. So people sometimes still talk about a guardian angel. Yes. And I, I don't remember if it was the ka or the ba or the kat or which, which uh, element it was in the Egyptian religion, but there was an exact duplicate of that in the, mm. the Egyptian faith. So this, if you think of it, if a, if a body actually dies and people believe there are multiple aspects of the soul, they think there's one aspect that goes off into heavenly realms. Right. They think that there's, there's this other aspect that remains around the body, but not exactly connected, and that's mm-hmm. what ended up being in more modern times, the guardian angel. But then in Orthodox and Catholic faith, people want to be close to the bodies of what, who they perceive are holy people. They want to be buried next to them for facility, you know, to facilitate the move to uh, heavenly realms. And if they're praying, they think there's some sort of a power emanating from the remains. And that, in different faiths, they they call it. Um, uh, I forget the actual term. Um, merit. They they call it merit, where you get some sort of a spiritual essence that remains with the body that can help the living, mm-hmm. and then. There's other aspects that move on. So here's the problem. If part of it remains with the body, but the body is going to decay quickly, mm-hmm. it won't benefit people for too long, oh, which I is see. why I believe they can continue to do mummification Christianity. And it's one of the reasons the self-mummified people chose to do it to themselves while still alive. Over the years doing the research that you've done on mummification, Ken, have, has there have been any examples where mummification has actually been used in a successful um, in a successful way of the believer using the mummified body as a as a way to increase whatever they're looking for i don't know if you could ever even prove that yeah. uh, and me personally when i start looking into this i find it fascinating it is but i look yeah. into it only to figure out what the different societies' beliefs are regarding life and afterlife and mm-hmm. death and uh, possibilities of reincarnation, that kind of thing. It's obviously nothing you could prove. Yeah. Um, is there one central focal point with all the different religions, all the different cultures, and all the different societies when it comes to mummification? Um, it, it gets interesting. There are definitely similarities everywhere. Right. Um, and if we look at some of the mummies in Peru, so mm-hmm. you have the mummified bodies of Incan kings, and they were intentionally mummified, um, internal organs removed, right. put into seated postures, and there's some really weird things that used to happen with the, mu- the mummified kings, where they actually had people who were specially trained to communicate for the mummy. So people could come and ask the mummy for advice or in, even wow. instructions, and someone would give them. And, and we have no idea what this means. Would that be I like a modern... This on the, I'm, I'm sorry, would that be like a modern-day medium communicating with the person on the other side? I think so. Yeah. Or I'm always thinking, too, the other possibility that whoever it is that gets that job mm-hmm. can now kind of take control of the entire society and do whatever he wants. Isn't yeah, that that's true? What, that's what the boss just said. Make sure you do this. Oh, wow. But there's another weird thing that they supposedly had to do. And I mentioned this on the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, and I, I really felt strange doing so, that there's uh, text from the 1500s mm-hmm. with uh, Spanish explorers saying that these people were specially trained, and they had to take the mummies outside to urinate. Now, I don't even know what that could possibly mean, since the mummy obviously can't urinate, but this is one of the job descriptions that these people had. Now, if you forget the kings and go to another aspect of Incan mummification, Mm -hmm. they used to bring their most perfect children, not not any any child that had some sort of an issue, um, deformed or anything like that, their most perfect children they'd bring Mm -hmm. to mountaintops and give them either maize beer to make them go asleep or actually strike them over the head. And the bodies would freeze up there. So they'd be perfectly mummified. And then they thought that those children could function as intermediaries between themselves and gods. Ken, stand by. We've got to take our... Ken, we've got to take a break. Please stand by. Exonation. Ken Jeremiah is a special guest this hour. His website is www.kenjeremiah.com. 
We're talking about mummification this uh, segment of the show, but we're also going to be getting into UFOs and uh, the correlation between the Bermuda Triangle and humans piloting UFOs. Interesting hour, interesting gentleman. Ken and I will be back as we continue investigating the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology right here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. And before we get back to our guest this hour, uh, Ken Jeremiah, a couple of uh, programming in and notes uh, that uh, two new shows that are going to be starting with us in the month of January of 2019. We have Heart to Heart with Dan and Angela Hart. And uh, I'm sorry, Dan and Angela Clark. The name of the show is Heart to Heart. And then the very best of Dr. Carl O'Helvey. That's coming this January to the Exxon Broadcast Network. My guest this hour is Ken Jeremiah, and his website is KenJeremiah.com. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to fathom why somebody would need to take the mummy out to the washroom. I know. <laughs> like that, that, that it could have, could have, is it possible that this is, was this done early on in the mummification process, or was this done throughout the the um, the reign of the mummy. From what it seems like, it's the reign of the mummy. Wow. And the problem is we don't have any of the mummies left. We only have the European descriptions of mm -hmm. them. Because by the time they came here, they ravaged everything, and a lot of things were destroyed, unfortunately. Doing the research that you've done on mummification, what would be the strangest part of the mummification uh, research that you've done that that you came across? I mean, next to well, the I washroom. The very... Oh, yeah, true. Uh, I think it's actually the very first investigation I ever did with people who mummified themselves while yeah. still alive. Um, and if I can get into that, oh, the, I'd the appreciate first it. individual... Sure, the, the first individual I visited, and mm -hmm. I still didn't know how they did this. I'm talking to a head priest at a temple uh, in Yamagata Prefecture in northern Japan, and he explains that the body I'm looking at... Oh, and by the way, if you if you have uh, Facebook and you go to self-mummified monks, it is a hyphen in there. There's tons of pictures of all the individuals I'm talking about. Wow. Um, I also have some pictures, uh, not a ton, but I have some pictures on my website as well. But the best site for it is that, that uh, Facebook page. Um, the, the first individual, Tetsumonkai, he was a, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Shinyokai. Haven't met Tensumokai yet. Shinyokai was a uh, farmer, and he was walking down the road mm -hmm. one day, and he had two bags of manure for use on his family farm, and he accidentally bumped into a samurai. Uh, samurai. And this guy got angry that he had manure on his, his uh, uniform, so he pulled his sword intending to cut down the farmer, and the guy shook off the manure bags and used his staff to defend himself and ended up killing the samurai. And the problem was, at the time, such an act would be a death penalty. But hmm. there was extraterritoriality if he entered a, a monastery. So he entered a Buddhist monastery, a Shingon Buddhist monastery, and eventually learned about the process of self-mummification and decided to do that. Self-mummification itself is a lengthy process, and it takes between three and ten years. So it's not one of those deals that someone gets a little bit depressed with life, decides to take themselves out. This is a long, uh, ex extremely excruciating process. They often trained at an area called what I called uh, Swamp of Wizards. That's how I translated it. But the actual Japanese term is Seninzawa. And it, Senin is it's from a Taoist term in China, but it means like otherworldly men and often mm -hmm. referred to Taoist wizards. And uh, Zawa refers to the mountain stream. So my translation, it was a little bit off. Um, 
but it just sounded better. Anyways, they, they trained there, and the idea was to gain enough merit, so enough accumulated merit within the flesh itself that it, their own bodies would benefit humankind. So they left with a problem because they want to directly initiate their own death. Um, if you think of death like a dream, mm -hmm. like the, the difference between waking up in a dream, if you know you're dreaming, lucid dream, you can direct where you're going, you can direct what you're doing. But if you're just swept up in the thing, you have no direction. Like right. you just go where it takes you. Yes. So they thought that if they died on their own, when they weren't expecting it, that they could not go to the Tushta heaven and train under the future Buddha, Maitreya, who will come back to help all of humankind. So they had a, a conundrum here. They wanted to do two different things. They wanted to go off to this heavenly mm -hmm. realm to help humans in the future, but they wanted their bodies left behind to help humans now. So they devised this method. It's actually from the uh, Taoist method, but it was kind of reinterpreted, if not misinterpreted. And they started a process called Mokujikigyo. That translates to tree eating, but it actually refers to abstention from cereals. So they gradually cut out cereals, and while they were doing that, they'd supplement their diet with things like pine needles, pine pine sap, pine resin. In some cases, urushi, uh, little bits of lacquer mm -hmm. in their water. And in one case, someone was drinking water that actually had a little bit of arsenic in it. After about between three and ten years, depending on the individual, they'd seek out a place where they'd bury themselves alive. Their followers would cover the top of the tomb and put in a bamboo breathing tube and they'd sit in that tomb, ringing a bell and chanting until their deaths. And once the followers heard the bell stop ringing, they took out the breathing tube, sealed the tomb, and left it alone for three years. At the end of three years, if the bodies had mummified when they were dug up, they were redressed, cleaned up, and then uh, enshrined in these temples, uh, special temple halls they called Sokobutsudo. If they hadn't mummified, they performed performed an exorcism, and then just reburied the bodies. Hmm. That's the strangest type of, medita uh, of mummification I know of. Is it only in, in uh, Japan where the self-mummification is actually done? As far as I know, wow. it's only Japan. There have been bodies found in Tibet mm -hmm. and China that display characteristics similar to that, but there's obvious human um, intervention meaning body, the skin was cut in some cases, or organs were taken out. And we don't know if that happened after the mummification or before. Sometimes people are dug up, they're actually mummified, and people want to make sure that mummification continues, so they take action. And in two of the cases in Japan, same mm -hmm. deal, that the bodies were found to be completely mummified, but they were lacquered after their uh, removal from the earth. So that the, the lacquer is a, is a, is a uh, preservation agent. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Unreal. Unreal. Yeah, it's strange stuff. It really is. Is is self mummification still going on this very day? No, it was uh, banned when the Meiji government took over. So it was banned mid eighteen hundreds, eighteen sixty nine, I believe it was banned. He took over in eighteen sixty seven, um, and ever since then it hasn't been done. There was an individual when it was actually made illegal who was in the process of mummifying himself, and he didn't want to, stop, uh, want to stop at all. So he continued, and then after his death, his descendants actually changed the date, so they pretended he did it earlier just to get away with it, and they could actually dig him up and then enshrine him. But other than that, it's, uh, it's a thing of the past. It's not happening anymore. In the research that you've done over the years uh, when it comes to mummification, which culture or society has... has perfected mummification in your opinion well i think everyone right now is kind of doing the same type of thing like when you when you go into a wake mm -hmm. those bodies are perfectly preserved and if they have to be dug up years later you find they're still pretty well preserved um mm. so i think everyone's kind of using the same type of techniques if you uh if you want to see an unbelievable mummy from the 1800s though uh, if anyone types in online, Rosalia Lombardo, it's a little Italian girl who's actually, her body is on display at the Capuchin um, crypt in Palermo in Sicily. 
And that body is in incredible position, uh, incredible condition with rosy red cheeks. And her mummifier was um, Salafia, who mummified a bunch of really high-ranking Roman Catholic um, priests. And we didn't know how he actually did it for years. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in 2005, the formula was actually found by one of his descendants in his office. And there was a National Geographic article published about it. And the the key ingredient, again, was arsenic. Hmm. But the arsenic obviously gave the rosy red skin. But he used a ton of glycerin as well, right. which kept the body more pliable. So if you type that in, it's, it's the most incredible body, the most incredible mummy I've seen. Rather macabre, isn't it? It's, it is. Or, it's or, very or, interesting. Or is it actually human art? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's like the, uh, I think the guy's name is Von Hagen, the uh, Body Worlds exhibit. Right, yeah. Which that to me is kind of strange, where you, you're taking flesh and turning it inside out, and I think the term is plastification, where they're literally turned into objects for study. Yeah. And I remember doing some research and finding individuals that wanted to do that after their death, and to me that seems strange. Just like donating your body to science, I guess. I guess so, yeah. yeah. But if you take a look at some of those uh, specimens, it's it's interesting. It's unusual. <laughs> All right, Ken, we've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, I'd like to talk sure. to you about UFOs. You know, we'll get off of the mummifications and get into UFOs. Explanation, our guest this hour is Ken Jeremiah. His website is www.kenjeremiah.com. And we'll both be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com for all the information on the Exxon Broadcast Network www.xzbn.net and you're listening to us around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, iHeart Radio, Simul Radio, and Simul TV. Ken Jeremiah and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. My guest this hour is Ken Jeremiah. He has appeared several times on History Channel's Ancient Aliens. He has written more than 10 books about various subjects, including critical thinking, history, and unusual phenomenon. He currently resides in Rhode Island. Now, the first half of the show, we talked about um, mummification. But now I'd like to ask you a question, uh, Ken. Do you think the con the conventional way of thinking about UFOs is right or wrong? Um, I don't... Well, before I even answer that, let me explain one thing that, that I'm always keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. So my background, my doctorate degree, is in critical thinking. Right. And critical thinking, if you ask someone to do it, most of the time they don't like to. So, for example, everything is supposed to be based on fact. Everything's supposed to be based on what can actually be proven. So if you went up to uh, even educators, uh, yeah. I'm an educator myself, so when I start talking about, about educators, uh, mm -hmm. I'm included. Um, if you start telling them, okay, do you think critically all the time? You want your students to think critically? And they'll always answer with yes, yes, I do. And then you ask one simple question. Okay, how many religions did you research before the one before deciding upon the one you currently adhere to? Right. And what is the, the scientific background, the historical background, and everything else that justifies that decision? They don't like thinking about that. And it's because the way we think is actually part of who we are. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm going to get into the alien thing in a second, sure. but I wrote an entire book 
talking about how a lot of the Christian ideas actually came from the Egyptian religion, I didn't get mm-hmm. much negative feedback. I really didn't. I got the most negative feedback when I started writing articles on the non-existence of Marco Polo. And if you just base it on historical analyses, all we need, we need three sources. So you got one book that's written by Rusticella de Pisa, mm-hmm. who everyone says, yeah, yeah, he was the ghost writer for Marco Polo, but there's no evidence of that. And then nothing in the text can be backed up with any other source outside of it. Right. So even if he existed, you shouldn't be teaching it as fact. It's just like, it, you know, if someone says, no, you should be teaching this fact, you're just like saying, okay, we're going to say the bug, that uh, the Easter Bunny is real. And there, yes, he, he appears in some books, mm-hmm. so you're going to teach him as real. And obviously everyone would laugh at that, but they do the same thing, not just with Marco Polo, but with certain phenomena. And things get surrounded, where everyone gets surrounded by certain ideas that infiltrate their minds, whether they know it or not. And it's very difficult to think clearly. So... When people start talking about UFOs, now, first of all, UFO, unidentified flying object, it could be anything in the sky. It doesn't right. refer to any sort of a craft. Right. I the agree. The other thing, they never connect that to USOs, the submerged objects. Mm-hmm. And perhaps they're the exact same objects that people are talking about. And we don't really have great uh, lexicon for it. We don't have good words to describe it the way things are being used. So I think there's a a big misunderstanding. And me as a linguist, I always look at the uh, the linguistics first. We're saying, okay, we really don't have good words to describe this. People are getting confused because of this. And obviously anything people come up with is just a theory. Mm -hmm. Well, my idea, thinking of critical thinking, is coming up with the most logical theory based on the knowledge we have. And that's the limitation, obviously, that our, our knowledge is imperfect all right but based on the way that you have looked at ufology with using critical thinking Mm -hmm. what do you believe ufos are i i mean the, the, the 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 ufos that people believe they are seeing and reporting to be coming from Mm -hmm. different planets yep there are tons of sightings every year as you well know i I looked at your site, I looked at your background, so I know you're very well-versed in this kind of thing, and and you're very knowledgeable about this subject. There are tons of sightings all the time. Right. So there's obviously something going on. And I personally do not believe it's a psychological thing. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's like mass hypnosis or anything like that. I believe it's a real phenomenon. Right. I believe that they're real objects. What I don't believe is that they're extraterrestrial because there is no evidence whatsoever that they're extraterrestrial. In fact, if we just look at our own personal uh, technology, now obviously this is limited because we might not have the technology others do, we wouldn't be able to go to other populated um, galaxies. We wouldn't be able to do that yet. So my thought is just thinking what's the most logical thing, that they're not Mm -hmm. extraterrestrial, they're terrestrial. They're from this planet. Right. Why is it then, if they're from this planet, so many people want to believe, or do believe, that some people have been abducted by aliens, and that the aliens themselves appear appear to be totally non-humanistic in character or in formation, that they really believe that Number one, they have been abducted by aliens. Number two, the aliens are extraterrestrial. And number three, they've been in the craft orbiting the Earth. How do we how do we kind of justify this using critical thinking? I believe all of those. Well, I shouldn't say all of them. I believe that uh, that abduction Mm -hmm. have occurred. That they definitely have occurred. I actually, by the way, I put all this information into a, a rather lengthy book. Some of my friends complain that the book is too long, called Remnants of a Distant Past, Mm -hmm. uh, about all of this information. So I do believe people have been abducted. But what I believe is, and this might sound really strange, but I personally think there's a ton of information to back this up, and I'll get into it if you want. I think that the uh, craft we're talking about Mm -hmm. are actually stationed in the deepest oceanic trenches on this planet. And what I believe is that 
whether it's subconscious or not, people don't like the idea that they don't know too much about their own history, about their own past, and about their own planet. But most of the oceans have yet to be discovered. That's true. The deepest oceanic trenches have not been sounded. We actually don't have the technology to sound all of them, mm-hmm. from, from what I understand. I'm not a scientist. Um, so why wouldn't they be coming from there? And I think the real problem is, if you start mentioning this might be where they're mm-hmm. coming from, people, even if it's on a subconscious level, could get scared, saying, well, wait a minute, if something's right here, like right under our feet, right next to us, and we don't understand it, that's a problem. And it's a problem to the ego. And I'm not talking you know, from a psychological perspective, but what makes us all tick, what makes us all move forward, what makes us all understand reality mm-hmm. is connected to our beliefs. And oh, we, we can explain our phenomena around us. We can explain all this stuff. If you start bringing up questions, and I always do this with, I do lectures sometime regarding history textbooks and what's taught in history and what's not. If you start leaving big blanks, saying, okay, everyone says human beings came out of Africa 200,000 years ago, but there's all this evidence that human beings are millions of years old. Mm -hmm. That causes a problem. And students don't like it, teachers don't like it, no one likes it, so they edit it out. So I I think that's the only reason people are always saying extraterrestrial must be from out of this planet. Gotcha. Why? So where does this fit in with the hollow earth theory, the flat world theory? Is this the human psyche trying to justify or trying to fill in the blanks? Tell you the truth, I did uh, very little research on the hollow earth theory, so Mm -hmm. I know nothing at all about it. Uh, The flat earth theory, I've talked to someone recently about Mm -hmm. that, and to me that doesn't make a ton of sense, but I understand their viewpoints and I find it interesting. Could we then? I don't think this fits into that at all from my from my viewpoint. So, so the fact that these these craft may be coming from the deepest parts of the ocean that have been yet to be discovered. Could we mm-hmm. actually look at Plato's Atlantis and try and say, well, maybe, maybe this is part of the Atlantean uh, myth or folklore? or That I think it connects into. And um, obviously everyone focuses on Atlantis because it's mm-hmm. the most famous one. Right. But if you forget that, just go back to uh, flood stories from societies around the world. There's over 550 different yes. flood stories or stories about the world before the flood. Right. And you have things like the uh, the ice monster that was destroyed. Now, obviously, they're talking about giant glaciers. Mm-hmm. There were glaciers miles of high, miles high over Europe, over the Americas, and then all of these things burst apart. I think approximately 12,500 BCE that they all burst apart. And you had this massive worldwide flood. And obviously Graham Hancock and a bunch of his um, uh, his fellow authors mm-hmm. did some great research on that, trying to pinpoint when that flood actually happened. But you see all these stories where some people survived the flood by tying boats to the tops of trees. You see others where people survived it by going up to the tops of mountains. Mm-hmm. Others survived the Samothrace version. Samothrace versions has people eating uh, mice that were coming out of holes in the ground, getting away from the water. And you see these old stories, too. I think it's in Turkey, underground structures that were developed to survive the Ice Age before that could house thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. And all of this indicates that there was this massive disaster. So if we now go to the Old Testament, we have the Noah's Ark story. Yes. Now, the old Noah's Ark story, if people aren't familiar with history, was almost stolen word for word from the Epic of Gilgamesh. All right, hold on. We're, we're going to take and, a bit of a cliffhanger sure. here because I've got to take my final break. And um, when sure. we come back, more with our very special guest this hour, Ken Jeremiah, whose website is www.kenjeremiah.com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're going to be wrapping up this hour as we continue investigating the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away.
And welcome back, one and all. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and our very special guest this hour is Ken Jeremiah. His website is www.kenjeremiah.com, and he has written more than 10 books. And first of all, Ken, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a great pleasure talking to you. Where can our listeners get buy uh, copies of your books? Uh, it's everywhere. If you just go to Amazon or any other online bookseller, you can find copies of all of the texts. Excellent. All, Excellent. all of the books are also listed on my Amazon author page and on my website itself. And, you know, they, they, they would be perfect gifts for Christmas. Like, these are great topics that, that you write about and that we've had the pleasure of discussing with you this hour. But Well, thank you. I find it interesting. <laughs> you know what? I History... I, I've I've had the pleasure of having Graham Hancock on the show a number of times. Michael Cremo, we've talked about awesome. you know, uh, hidden uh, you know, forbidden archaeology, forbidden history, mm-hmm. and and when I've looked at it and I've talked to these people who I respect, and, and then I hear the kids saying, you know what we learned in school, Grandpa? What, honey? Do you know who discovered America? Who? Christopher Columbus? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did, Grandpa. Right. It's in the book. Do you want to see? How can how can academia get away with the perpetual lies that they do? And what do what are they afraid of? It is amazing to me. And again, as an educator, I'm going mm-hmm. to put down some educators. Um, it's really difficult for me to convince teachers and administrators to leave open ideas. They don't want open ideas for students. They really don't. And they claim that they want all students to think critically. Exactly. Okay, well, why not present the evidence that human beings are millions of years old from Cremo's book? Right. right? Why not present that evidence? Well, no. And if you ask why, no one gives you a really good answer, but I think it's the same thing that if if students believe that we don't know every single thing that happened on this planet, Mm -hmm. they're left in like a state of... um, uh, insecurity or something like that. Now I find that ridiculous. Should they, shouldn't one of the propo- uh, shouldn't they Sorry, be in a ahead, shouldn't please. they be in a state of wonderment instead of insecurity? Yes. And that's what I always yeah. say. Like it doesn't matter. Who cares if they're insecure? Like one of the major things in getting someone to think critically is getting them out of their comfort zone. Right. You get someone out of their comfort zone, yep. they don't like it. Like uh, someone who who hates public speaking, for example, right? Yeah. How are they ever going to get better at that unless you shove them in front of an audience and say, "Okay, do it." Oh, that sucked. Of course, it sucks. You haven't done it before. You have to now, face your demons. Ten in times life. later, yeah. you're pretty good. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And just when you start targeting how people think, mm-hmm. people shut down. They really do shut down. I start. I try to do it. You know, I teach languages. Right. Uh, at the university level, I, I teach religious history, comparative religions, and history. But at the high school level, I teach languages. Mm-hmm. But I still try to include things like, um, even just recently, Sacsayhuaman in Peru, the, the wall that really there's no explanation on how that wall went up, who actually carved those things. Um, and, you know, if you want me to come back at some point, I can talk further about Sacsayhuaman. and love to get, have you back. You know, pictures and that yeah. kind of thing. But Sacsayhuaman is one of those sites that you look at these intricately carved mm-hmm. huge stones, the largest being, I think, 300 tons off the top of my, hu- top the top of my head. Sure. And they're carved like giant jigsaw puzzles. And the problem is the whole thing came, all of the stones came from five miles away over two mountains. And we can't duplicate that fact today, even with the biggest cranes we have, because there's no roads going over those mountains. And at the site, there's no microskeletons in the rocks. Well, at the quarry, there are microskeletons. We, we can't explain this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I always put it out to students and say, we just don't understand this. We don't know this. And i got to tell you, it's almost like they shut down. Yeah. That They don't even seem to be interested in it. Like, oh, well, yeah, we just can't figure it out. Because what? I think everything else is in place where mm-hmm. this is society, this is history. So anything that's outside that, we just can't explain they they never look into it. It's the strangest thing to me. It beca- if you can't explain it, doesn't that open up the door to wonderment, the door to exploration, the yeah. door to adventure, the 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 door to human growth? For goodness' sake. Yes, and I think that's all we need to do to continue to grow. Yeah, but I agree. People, they don't they don't do that. They don't want to do that, and that to me is just strange. It really is just bizarre. It is. I agree with you one hundred and fifty percent on that. You know, uh, I. 
I've seen in the same book that they use in schools where they say Christopher Columbus discovered the uh, discovered America. And in the same book, they're talking about the Vikings that were in Greenland <laughs> before. And then now with the work, uh, like I said, of, of Michael Cremo and Graham Hancock, Robert Bouval and the rest of them, we, we know mm -hmm. that that the the people of the Mediterranean were trading with the uh, with the natives around the Great Lakes to get the tin or copper to bring back to the Middle East. We know this, so why aren't we honest? Definitely. And why? What are we doing to our 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 the youth of today by perpetuating this I lie? I know it's so strange. And my own research, I I present this to students all the time, mm -hmm. and I you know, give references where I'm getting the stuff from. We had Europeans, Europeans mm -hmm. here in the 1300s. Sure. And even more amazing, we had Native Americans, the Mi'kmaq tribe, who were going over to Europe on their boats. So go back in time. Now, obviously, this forget about the millions of Native Americans who were already living here, and they had some of the most, you know, uh, incredible societies in the world. Yes. You look at uh, the... Uh, the Mayan um, cities mm -hmm. in Mexico City and, uh, and the Inca and the Aztec cities in different places. They're, they're just incredible monuments. Mm -hmm. And yet students, when they start thinking about American history, they're thinking European slash U.S. history. Yeah. They're not thinking the history of the Americas at all, which is in, in just crazy to me. I don't understand why anyone would do that. Well, it's, it's just but as cra it's just as crazy as when you when you imagine the cowboys and the Indians. The cowboys are the good guys. Sure. When actually they're the invaders. Yes, but, you know it's like come on, yep. guys, it's, let's get it straight. There was a great book, uh, "Lies My Teacher Told Me," I think by Lowen, um, where it was he presented some of the history that was presented in textbooks, like mm -hmm. okay, the Europeans moved in, took the land from the Native Americans, yeah. and started farming. But what they didn't tell them was the Native Americans were already farming. All they did was shove them out and took over their land. Exactly. That kind of thing. Exactly. So. Even the, the transfer of information between the Americas and Europe, let's forget that for a second, go even further back in time. Mm -hmm. New Kingdom Egyptian mummies, I'm pretty sure you're, you're familiar with this. A few of them were found that had traces of cocaine. And since cocaine was only found in the Americas, they yeah. said, well, this is strange. And the first mummies were said, well, you know what? This is owned by a private individual in England. Could be transferred. Then there was an unsealed tomb I'm sorry, a, a sealed tomb that was, when, when unsealed, they found some mummies in it, and they tested those, New Kingdom mummies, and they found that they also had cocaine in them. And at the time the first tests were done, they couldn't test for this, but the second one indicated that the cocaine was actually ingested, which tells us that the ancient Egyptians were definitely in contact with the Americas, which now explains how the pyramids in Egypt and the largest pyramid in the world, which is in Mexico City, and the ones in South America, all resemble each other. Why can't we, or no, I'm, I know, let me rephrase that. Why cannot the majority of people believe that humankind could have made the wonders that we see today, like the Great Pyramids or the artifacts in Peru, that they have to add the extraterrestrial um, element. I don't understand that. Yeah. I really don't. I truly believe that we have a cyclical nature of time. Mm -hmm. And it sounds strange in the Western world because for most people in the Western world, it's all they're familiar with. But the majority of the world's faith always held a cyclical view of time, including almost every single Native American tribe. And when I say Native American, some people confuse what I'm saying. I'm using it I'm using the term as a linguist would. I'm talking about every single country. Right. United States, Mexico, all Central American countries, all the South American countries. So all of those uh, cultures, for the most part, believe in cyclical uh, nature of creation and destruction. Of course, and that we relates perfectly did. to the uh, to the Mayan calendar. Cyclical. Yes. Yeah, yeah everything was cyclical. Yep. So if you think of this, if the last major flood supposedly happened more than 14,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that they were, obviously the technology would be different, but is it possible that they were just as technologically advanced as we are now? And if so, like think of everything now. 
I guarantee you, about 100 years from now, most libraries will cease to exist because yes. everything's going to be about everything's going to be digital. Right. So if there's a major disaster that wipes out everything, 12,000 years after that disaster, what's going to be left? There's going to be no evidence of it. It's like we weren't here at all. And then you have the tribes of the future, 12,000 years from now, saying there's no way people back then had the technology we have now. I think that's completely false. Can I, think I in can, the past... Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. No, I, I'm just saying that. Uh, unfortunately, our time for tonight is up, my friend. Um, well, okay, we can continue another time. I, I would appreciate that, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity, number one, of thanking you so much for sharing your time with us. I know that you're a very busy man. Um, thank you for no all problem. the great work that you do. It is truly appreciated on this side of the microphone. Well, thank you. And, and to you and your family, the very best of the holiday season, and nothing but health, happiness, spirituality, and love for 2019. Also to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Take care of yourself, Ken. And Exonation, if you'd like to get more information about our guest this hour, Ken Jeremiah, his website is www.kenjeremiah.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Whatever you do, do not, I mean do not go away. We'll be right back. 